Chapter 11. What's the point? In some classrooms, teachers choose the weekly spelling words. Not so in Mrs. Jewell's class. She lets her students pick. Nearly everyone had a hand raised. Mrs. Jules called on Rondi. Pistachios, said Rondi. This is why teachers don't let their students choose words. Mrs. Jules couldn't spell pistachios. So she did what every teacher everywhere does in such situations. That's an excellent word, Rondi, she said. Would you like to come up and write it on the board? Rondi came to the front of the room. Mrs. Jules paid close attention as Rondi wrote pistachios on the whiteboard. I love pistachios, said Kathy, when Rondi returned to her seat. Me too, said Allison. They're my third favorite nut. Mrs. Jules called on DJ. Grumple, he said. I don't think grumple is a word, Mrs. Jules pointed out. So, asked DJ, we should still know how to spell it. Yeah, it might be uh, become a word someday, Kathy agreed. Mrs. Jules wrote grumple under pistachios. Joy raised her hand. A, she suggested. A what, asked Mrs. Jules. Just A, said Joy. Don't you think that's a little too easy, said Mrs. Jules. Oh, it's a very common word, said Kathy. It's important that we all know how to spell it. Mrs. Jules couldn't argue with that, and she added A to the spelling list. Myron had had his hand raised. Yes, Myron, said Mrs. Jules. What's the point, Myron asked. Um, that's three words, said Mrs. Jules. All good ones, too, chirped Kathy. The cloud of doom is getting bigger every day, Myron exclaimed. What does it matter if we can spell? So we can read and write, Mrs. Jules replied. What's the point of reading, asked Leslie. What's the point of writing, asked Jason. What's the point of math, asked Benjamin. There is no point, Myron grumbled. He slammed his pencil down hard on his desk. The point broke off of it. I understand you're scared and upset, said Mrs. Jules. But what's the point of quitting? We can all just sit around and grumble, or we can try to do our best cloud or no cloud. And it hasn't been all bad, Mrs. Jules continued. We've been getting a whole lot more nail clippings. That was true. Ever since the cloud of doom appeared, Everyone's fingernails and toenails had been growing a lot faster. They had to be clipped three or four times a week. The number on the board was now 19,457. Someday the cloud of doom will be gone, said Mrs. Jules, and the world will be a much better place, even better be than before the cloud. Colors will be more colorful, music will be more musical, even Miss Mush's food will taste good. The bigger the storm, the brighter the rainbow. At that moment, a crack of thunder shook the classroom and the lights went out. The children screamed. They weren't scared. They just liked screaming in the dark. Mrs. Jules lit a candle and everyone settled down. Now, shall we continue with our spelling? Jenny raised her hand and suggested hope. Excellent word, said Mrs. Jules. She held her candle with one hand and the marker in the other. She said the letters out loud as she wrote them on the whiteboard. H-O-P-E. Cloud of doom sounds like something we've got going on right now. Pretty crazy. Chapter 12, Mrs. Surla. The library was on the seventh floor. Mrs. Surla was the librarian. A giant stuffed walrus sat next to her desk. The walrus was bigger than most kids in the school and a couple of teachers too. Kindergartners often got scared the first time they saw Mrs. Surlaw's walrus. When they dared touch one of its giant tusks, however, they discovered it was as soft as a pillow. There were lots of rules in the library. No eating, no drinking, no yelling, no somersaults, and no hugging the walrus until after you've checked out a book. Mrs. Surla wheeled her book cart along a row of bookcases. She picked up a book, turned to the last page, and then put it on the shelf where it belonged. 
She took another book, checked its last page, and put that one in its proper place as well. Hmm. She heard the rumble of feet on the stairs and the chirps and sh shrieks of young voices. This was followed by shushing sounds. Oh. Mrs. Jules politely entered the library. They were scared of Mrs. Surlaw. While the two adults greeted each other, the children scurried into different parts of the library. They had only 15 minutes to choose and check out a book. Have you read The Pig, The Princess, and The Potato? Leslie asked Jenny. Is it good? Only the best book ever. Mrs. Surlaw smiled when she heard that. The only thing she loved more than books were children who loved books. She may have seemed severe on the outside, but inside her heart was as soft as a pillow. Some libraries have separate areas for fiction and nonfiction. Mrs. Surlaw didn't believe in that sort of thing. After all, who was able to decide what was true and what wasn't? She also didn't believe in alphabetical order. Her books were organized by number of pages. Skinny books were at one end of the library and the fat ones were on the opposite end. Along the shelves were number markers, 10, 20, 30, all the way up to a thousand. If someone in Mrs. Jewell's class wanted to read this book, he or she could find it between 180 and 190 markers. Joy was looking through the books between 30 and 50 uh, between 40 and 50 markers. She had already read every book in the library with fewer than 40 pages. Allison liked long novels. She was looking through the ones that were between 230 and 240. Jason, Jason stood behind her, watching. At last, Allison chose her book. It had 232 pages. Jason took the one next to it with 233 pages. Allison scowled at him. She put her book back and then chose one farther down on the shelf with 238 pages. Allison pretended not to notice, even though she was burning inside. She looked at her book. Oh, uh, I think I already read this, she said aloud. She returned it to the shelf. La -di -da, she said, oh, what book do I want to read? Suddenly, she dashed to the end of the aisle and around the corner. Jason had trouble squeezing his book back into place. By the time he did, he couldn't see Allison anywhere. He went from one end of the library to the other, searching between the aisles. When he finally saw her, she was hugging the walrus. That meant she had already checked out her book. He went to her. Uh, hey, Allison, he said. Can I see your book? No, she replied. How many pages is it? He asked. I'm not telling you. More than 300? Maybe. No way, he said. Even you wouldn't read a book with more than 300 pages. Allison shrugged. Hmm. More than 350, he asked. Maybe. 500? Maybe. Just tell me the title. No. I'm just trying to help you, he explained. Maybe I've already read it. I could tell you if it's any good. You don't want to read a 500-page book if it's boring or has a bunch of kissing in it. Rondi finished checking out her book and then hugged the walrus too. Let's go, Rondi, said Allison. Jason watched the two girls leave the library. He went to Miss Surlaw. Um, how many pages in Allison's book? He asked. I'm sorry, Jason, the librarian told him. That is confidential information. <sighs> Jason sighed. He returned to the bookshelves, wondering if Allison really chose a book with 500 pages. It seemed impossible. Nobody could read a book that long, even if it had big print and short chapters. Still, he couldn't be sure. And just to be safe, he chose a book with 510 pages. There was no way Allison chose a longer book than that. He started to bring it to Miss Surlaw. But what if she did? He put the book back and then found one with 573 pages. She couldn't have chosen a book with more pages than that. Again, he started to Mrs. Surlaw's desk. But what if she did? He returned the book to its place on the shelf and then chose one from 
with 611 pages. A moment later, he returned it. No matter which book, book he chose, the same question kept returning. But what if she did? Finally, Jason chose the last book on the last shelf at the very end of the library. He had to hold it with both hands as he lugged it to the checkout desk. The number on the last page was 999. The book made a loud thud as he plopped it down on the desk. Excellent choice, Jason, Mrs. Surla said when she read the book. I know you will enjoy reading it. Reading it? He couldn't even carry it. Jason hugged the walrus. Chapter 13, Umbrella. Sherry liked walking in the rain. She liked stomping through the puddles in her yellow rain boots. Most of all, she loved her umbrella, even if it did get heavy after a while. Her umbrella was purple with green stripes, or maybe it was green with purple stripes. She couldn't be sure. The whole thing was covered with yellow polka dots of different sizes. She liked listening to the raindrops bounce off of it. The harder it rained, the better the sound. She liked and the feel of the smooth curved wooden handle. She was still a block away from school when she heard the whoop whoop. Now she was gonna be late. She had done too much pedal stomping and not enough straight ahead walking. She tried to hurry, but it was difficult to run while carrying her umbrella, especially in her yellow boots. By the time she reached the outer edges of the school, the eight minute warning bell was already clanging. She counted the clangs and was disappointed when they stopped at eight. She was hoping for a porcupine. Glancing down, she noticed the sidewalk around the school was dry. She stuck out one hand. The rain seemed to have stopped. She tilted the umbrella a little to the side and looked up. The cloud of doom had kept all the other clouds away, including the rain clouds. Sherry glared at the horrible cloud. It almost seemed alive as it churned inside itself. Suddenly, a gust of wind tore the umbrella from her hand. Horrified, she watched it bounce across the blacktop towards the school. She chased after it. The umbrella hit a bike rack and stuck there for a moment. But just as Sherry got there, it swooped upward. She jumped and managed to grab the curved handle. But the umbrella continued to rise. She thought about letting go, but she didn't want to lose her umbrella. She held on with both hands. When she passed the second floor window, she realized she probably should have let go sooner. When she rose past the third floor, she wished she had let go at the second floor. When she reached the fourth floor, she wished she had let go when she was back at the third floor. By the time she reached the sixth floor, it was definitely too late. Her left rain boot slipped off when she passed the ninth floor. She watched it fall the long way down. Higher and higher, scarier and scarier, she passed the 17th floor, the 18th, and the 20th. There was no 19th. She could see inside the classroom windows as she went past them. Some of the kids waved at her. She couldn't wave back. She couldn't risk falling. Although her alternative wasn't much better. If she continued to hang on, she realized, she'd be sucked into the cloud of doom. She passed the 25th floor, then the 26th and the 27th. She knew the floor numbers by the teacher she saw in the windows. At the 30th floor, she could see her own desk next to the window. The window was open. She closed her eyes, then jumped. A horn blared. When Sherry opened her eyes, she lay sprawled across the top of her desk. Oh, you are here, Sherry, said Mrs. Jules. Funny, I didn't see you. I was just about to mark you absent. Were you sleeping? Maybe it was a dream. She hoped so. If not, her favorite umbrella was lost forever. Her left foot felt cold. On her right foot, she wore a yellow rain boot, but on the left, just a thin red sock. Chapter 14, Mr. K and Dr. P. Author's note, due to strict rules about confidentiality and to avoid unnecessary embarrassment for those involved, 
The names of the characters have been omitted from the story. Please don't try to guess. Mr. K headed up the stairs. He wore a paper bag over his head. It was 10 o'clock in the morning. All the little brats, as he liked to call them, should be in class, but he wore the paper bag just in case he encountered a stray one. When he reached the third floor, he tripped over the top step and fell into the landing. I knew I should have cut out some eye holes, he said to himself. His knee hurt, but that was the least of his worries. He got back to his feet and limped up the stairs. Actually, only one eye hole would have helped. His left eye was shut tight. His other eye was wide open. The eyebrow was raised in a constant expression of surprise. By counting the steps, he knew when he reached the fourth floor. He felt his way to the door and knocked. Yes, who's there? asked Dr. P from the other side. Mr. K did not want to say his name aloud in case anyone was listening. He opened the door and entered. If Dr. P was surprised to see a person with a bag over his head, he didn't show it. He had been trained to keep a straight face no matter what. Whenever someone came to see him, it was part of his job to act like everything was perfectly normal. Yes, what seems to be the problem? He asked, stroking his beard. Mr. K removed the bag. Oh, he's screamed Dr. P, throwing both his hands up in the air. He quickly regained composure. <clears throat> so, why did you come to see me? He asked as he rubbed his beard. Mr. K made an eh noise as he pointed to his face. Your face is stuck, said Dr. P. Dr. K nodded. Mr. K nodded. Please have a seat. Mr. K sat on the couch. Dr. P came closer to get a better look. He poked the puffed out cheek. Does this hurt? He asked. Mr. K shook his head. How about this? And he tugged on the tip of Mr. K's tongue. Again, Mr. K shook his head. Very interesting, said Dr. P. He walked to the bookshelf. Hmm, he muttered as he tried to find the right book he needed. Ah, this should do it, he declared, removing a very fat book. He bonked Mr. K on top of the head with it. Ah, exclaimed Mr. K. Any better, said Dr. P. I, I hung, said Mr. K without moving his lips. Hmm. This will be more difficult than I thought, said Dr. P. He returned to the bookshelf, chose a different book, and brought it to his desk. He thumbed through the pages, cold feet, sticky fingers. Ah, here we are, stuck face. He silently read to himself for a minute, then looked up and said, did you have a pet when you were a child? Mr. K nodded. Dr. P looked back in his book and read some more, a cat. Mr. K shook his head. A dog. He nodded. Did you love your dog? Mr. K's head didn't move at all. A tear trickled out of his eye and dripped down his face. Excellent, declared Dr. P. I think we're making real progress. He shut the book, scooted his chair up real close, and leaned toward Mr. K. Look into my eyes, he said. With one eye, Mr. K stared at Dr. P. Dr. P stared back. He held up a gold chain with a green stone attached. He let the stone swing gently back and forth between them. Their faces were so close the stone barely missed their noses. I'm gonna take you back to another time and place, said Dr. P. You are just a young boy playing with your dog in our, your backyard. Your grandmother smiles from the kitchen window a pie is baking in the oven. You can smell the cinnamon. Mr. K's nose twitched. Now your grandmother is outside holding the pie. She asks if you want some. Mr. K's tongue remains sticking out. However, it slowly moved from side to side of his mouth. Dr. P noted the breakthrough. But instead of giving you a piece of pie, he said, she smashes it in your face. Mr. K's mouth popped open, then his face snapped back into place. His eyebrow lowered, his eye opened, his cheek unpuffed, his tongue went back where it belonged. Why did she do that to me? He cried. Dr. P handed him a tissue. 
Mr. K wiped his eyes and then cleaned the imaginary pie off his face. He stood straight up and straightened his suit. You uh, won't tell anybody uh, anything about this, will you? He asked. Everything that happens inside this office is strictly confidential, Dr. P assured him. Mr. K left the office feeling as dignified as ever. Dr. P leaned back in his chair with his hands behind his head. He felt very satisfied. It's not every day that he gets to help someone as important as Mr. K. Dr. P's tongue was sticking out. His left eyebrow was raised. His right eye was shut tight, and it looked like he was trying to swallow a tennis ball. Chapter 15, The Unbreakables. It's bad enough when two friends fight. It's even worse when three friends pick on a fourth. Joe and John were best friends. Shut up, said Joe. You shut up, said John. Rondi and Allison were best friends. May I borrow a pencil, asked Allison. Here, stick it up your nose, said Rondi. Maybe it was because they were worried and anxious about the cloud of doom looming above them. Maybe it was because their fingernails and toenails were growing too fast. For whatever reason, the longer everyone spent beneath the cloud, the crabbier they got. Mauricia, Joy, Dee Dee, and Ron were more than just best friends forever. Their friendship was so strong, they called themselves the Unbreakables. Every morning, they met before school by the flagpole. They had a special four-handed handshake. It would, each would hold out one hand and they'd lock thumbs to pinkies. Then they'd raise and lower their hands three times and shout, Unbreakable! The lunch bell kaboinked four times and the Unbreakables headed down the stairs together. I wonder what we're having today, Dee Dee said. Didn't you count the kaboinks? asked Mauricia. Oh, spaghetti and feet balls, said Joy. Hmm, oh, I like those, said Dee Dee. You would, said Ron. They smell as bad as your feet. He held his nose. My feet don't stink, said Dee Dee. Joy held up her nose too and said, Not you, but everyone else. Mauricia and Ron laughed. They entered the cafeteria. Dee Dee took a tray and pushed it to Miss Mush. The lunch teacher handed her a plate of spaghetti topped with foot-shaped meat patty. Dee Dee set the plate on her tray next to her history book. She was careful not to spill any feet sauce. Her half-finished homework was folded inside the book. It was due after lunch. She sat down with the others at one of the long tables. She cut off a piece of the feet ball, swished it around in the sauce, and ate it. You eat the heel first? asked Mauricia. So what's wrong with that? asked Dee Dee. It's gross, said Ron. You're supposed to start with the toes. Who says? It's just how it's done, said Joy. Ask anyone. You don't know everything, Dee Dee said angrily as she took her, she shook her fork at her friends. A bit of sauce dripped on her paper. Now look what you did, she accused them. You did it to yourself, said Joy. Dee Dee tried to wipe it up with her napkin, but it only made it worse. Now I have to start all over, she complained. Dee Dee remained in the cafeteria long after her friends left to play. She still had one question to answer and one last toe to eat. It didn't seem fair that her friends were outside playing while she was stuck inside. Stupid Ron, she muttered. Stupid Mauricia, stupid Joy, they're the ones with stinky feet. When at last she finished, she put her dishes in the tray and dumped her trash. She hurried out of the lunchroom and down the stairs. Once outside, she saw them playing three square and wasn't sure if she even wanted to join them. Suddenly her face filled with horror. Oh no, she called out and pulled her hair with both hands. Oh, she didn't have her homework or her history book. She turned and ran straight up the building. Miss Mush and Mr. Pepper Ratter were busy wiping the counters with dish rags when Dee Dee came rushing up to them. Oh, hi, Dee Dee. Did you want seconds? Miss Mush asked hopefully. We put everything away, but I'd be happy to heat up another plate for you. Out of breath, Dee Dee explained to her about the book and the homework. Neither Miss Mush nor Mr. Pepper Ratter remembered seeing anything. 
Oh, and I've already dumped all the trash, said Mr. Pepper Adder. There were four large dumpsters in the back of Wayside School. A pair of feet was sticking up out of one of them. Upside down, buried in the trash, Dee Dee tried to read every wrinkled and soggy piece of paper as she dug through half-eaten feet balls, strands of spaghetti, drippy milk cartons, apple cores, pickle slices, and who knows what else. It's impossible. There's no way, she cried. Then, just when all hope seemed lost, a noise came from somewhere deep in the dumpster next to hers. Found it, Ron called. Rustling sounds could be heard from inside the other two dumpsters as well. Hooray, cheered Mauricia. Wow, what a relief, shouted Joy. Yes, there were six other feet sticking up from the dumpsters. They were the Unbreakables. Not even the cloud of doom could destroy their friendship, but that was only the first test. The ultimate test was still to come. Nice friends. <laughs>